Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Wiglet. This is our 10th video now. Thank you so much to all of my subscribers, to all my followers on my various platforms. It really means an awful lot and it really helps the videos go and the channel go from success to success. And with that in mind, we are on to exam success, continuing our series on understanding Macbeth. We're on to a very pivotal scene today. It's Act 1, Scene 7 of the Scottish play. So, as always, what can you do with this video? Uh, there are a number of different uh, resources, as we say in our videos. Um, first of all, take notes. Make sure you're using the highlights and the annotations and the points I'm bringing up to develop and further enhance what you know. You can always use this to help build mind maps if you're more of a visual learner. In addition, you can use it as a revision tool, uh, either by yourself, with classmates, with friends, who may be studying towards those all important exams. And in addition, you can use it to help annotate your own copy of the text. Many students, uh, almost every student, if all, not all the students I've taught, have had a copy themselves as they've studied this, and it can be something you use alongside your annotations or to annotate your copy. And last but not least, you can use it as a way of listing examples um, for various themes, various characters, or even plot points themselves in the play. So, what actually happens before Act 1, Scene 7? A very brief scene, actually. In Act 1, Scene 6, Duncan and his entourage, that's uh, his court, along with his son Malcolm, who we remember we learnt in Act 1, Scene 4, has just been made heir. Banquo is also there. They're greeted at Macbeth's castle of Dunsinane by Lady Macbeth. Lady Macbeth is quoted as saying, All our service in every point, twice done, then double done. Notice those words like all, and then a repetition of done, showing how subservient, how deferential and respectful she's being to the King of Scotland here. And in response to this, Duncan and Banquo are completely charmed and feel at ease in the presence and atmosphere of the castle of Dunsany. We, the audience, hear such quotes says, this castle hath a pleasant seat. It's a very first line in that scene from Duncan. And in addition, we then have Banquo describing how the very air is delicate um, in this particular scene, in this particular area. So they have no clue whatsoever of the horrors that will unfold as a result of their very hosts in Dunsany. Now, Act 1, Scene 7 is largely the scene of Lady Macbeth's manipulation of Macbeth. We see Macbeth change an awful lot in this scene. For instance, the scene begins with Macbeth questioning whether he should murder Duncan that very night. We hear him say, we will proceed no further in this business. After a long soliloquy of doubts, hesitation, he decides that that's not what's going to happen and that instead he is very much going to um, be the honourable uh, Thane of Cordor that he has just been newly promoted to. In response to this, Lady Macbeth uses such tactics as humiliation and intimidation to motivate Macbeth into committing the act. For example, she says, What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? This idea of surely some otherworldly being would have instead uh, suggested such an idea not a mere man, a pathetic man, as Macbeth is coming across in this very scene. Notice the pronoun you as well, that she's putting the blame and putting the pressure on him himself. And in addition, Lady Macbeth's powers of persuasion, particularly around the idea of masculinity, prove to be effective. We hear, her, we hear Macbeth say, um, after he's been persuaded, bring forth men children only. Macbeth has a real issue with being perceived as anything other than manly and other than masculine. And Lady Macbeth uses this weakness to uh, full effect and great success. So we begin with the scene itself. And we have this very significant, very important soliloquy from Macbeth uh, as he is by himself. He begins by saying, if it were done when it is done, then to a well it were done quickly. And we notice this repetition of done, demonstrating this kind of hesitation, because nothing's done. Okay. Macbeth hasn't murdered Duncan yet. It's uh, this, this effect of constantly talking about doing it rather than actually committing the deed. We also see here this repetition of if 
further reinforcing the council's decision. You know, if is conditional tense of if and if is not certain. Okay, it's very much still in up in the air. As the soliloquy progresses, we see this quote that but this blow might be the be all and the end all here. Here Macbeth is wishing this would just be a one time decisive act. You know that this would be the be all and the end all. That into killing, into kill Duncan rather, he would have everything ready, everything done, no need for any hesitation. However, he's very much aware that it's not as simple as that. Commenting how, but on here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. A reference to his soul and a reference to the afterlife. This sense that if he does this, he knows he will cast his eternal soul into damnation. A very important aspect, particularly in such a religiously devout um, society as the one the play was both formed in and set in. Continuing forward, the only pro the, the idea of his soul is not the only problem. He also mentions how bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor. He's not only worried about the fragility and the sanctity of his soul, he is also worried about revenge. He fears this aspect of revenge. Bloody instructions that he will uh, commit will only come back to haunt him. Someone else will do the same to him. There's no guarantee that this act will be, as he mentioned earlier, the be-all and the end-all. As he continues, he even throws himself into further doubt. He's here in double trust. Macbeth is conscious of betraying Duncan. Okay, he's not blind to this. Macbeth is an intelligent man. He realises that what he's doing here is actually a very untrustworthy um, act and deed. He mentions how first he's there as his kinsman, then as his host. There are two layers to this level of deceit. First of all, it's not just being his ally, being the newly promoted Thane of Cawdor, the person in the court of Duncan, but also his host. He's meant to be protecting him. He is the soldier who is meant to be guarding Duncan's fortunes, and he's the one that will murder him, an ultimate act of betrayal there. Continuing on, we notice how Macbeth mentions how this Duncan has borne his faculties so meek, his virtues will plead like angels. Here we see how Macbeth is aware of what a good, holy king Duncan is. That Mac Duncan is actually seen by the gods as someone virtuous, most angelic. But in doing so, it will only mean that he will ascend to heaven. Whereas by contrast, Macbeth will further condemn himself to hell. He then finalises this soliloquy by saying, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. Here he's saying how he realises his reasons for the murder of the king, or regicide, to use the correct term, are simply not enough. What he's actually doing here is just murdering the king for the sake of a little bit of ambition for a crown. Is it worth the consequences and the cost of his soul or the cost of revenge? Macbeth has convinced himself at the end of this soliloquy that it really isn't. But as the scene continues, we see things are slightly different. Lady Macbeth then enters, and Macbeth begins by saying, we will proceed no further in this business. Notice how decisive he is at this point. We're not going to kill Duncan, and that is it. Or is it? Macbeth mentions how he has honoured me of late, and I have brought golden opinions from all sorts of people. This idea that he's got more to lose than he has to gain. Macbeth has just been recently promoted as the Thane of Cawdor, but also he's also in high esteem. People think well of Macbeth, Macbeth is the hero. As befitting a tragedy, we see our hero acknowledge how they are actually a good guy, for want of a better term, and how these golden opinions are um, as valuable to him as the golden round that Lady Macbeth mentioned in Act 1, Scene 5. Lady Macbeth, however, is very decisive in the way she describes this. She comments and says, Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Here she is openly mocking her husband, using this idea of him being out of his mind to possibly suggest such an act. From this time such I account thy love, she combines this element with mocking with her own love. She's saying that through this use of emotional manipulation, she couldn't possibly love him if he were not to go ahead with this. She then continues by saying, and live a coward in thine own esteem, this sense of mocking his lack of courage and conviction saying that he would be less of a person for not doing this. So she's very clear and very 
very forthright in her manipulative tactics. And we see how successful it is. Macbeth says, I do dare do all that may become a man. And in this, he's clearly affected by her words and they clearly work well. There is uh, this sense of him worrying about his manliness, his masculinity, and he feels he has to uh, prove that in responding back to Lady Macbeth here. Continuing the scene, we see that she further pushes this uh, problem, this position, even further with Macbeth. She says, what beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me? Just as I said early in the video, if you'll recall, um, she continues to mock Macbeth. You know, this couldn't have been his thoughts. This must have been some beast. This must have been someone, something greater than him. Um, why would you say it? And notice she puts the onus back on him. The pronoun, you break this enterprise to me. When really we know that she was very much the manipulative one from Act 1, Scene 5. She very much is partly the reason, if not the greatest reason, why Macbeth is here in the first place. And as we continue, she says, then you were a man, be so much more than man. Notice this repetition of masculinity, to be the man, to man up, for want of a better term here, um, to, to be a better man would be to murder Duncan. She knows his fragile sense of masculine identity will fall apart here if it, she continues the way she does. Now, she uses the analogy of a, a young child, the babe that milked me, she says, I would, while it was smiling in my face, I plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. It uses this extremely violent imagery of infanticide, the murder of a child, to talk about the depths she would go for such a chance, taking the most vulnerable, fragile of all life, and, and brutally, very vividly describing how she would murder it in order to get the crown. Um, and a reaction, uh, an imagery that is so vivid that it often gets reaction in my classes, and rightly so. But Beth then says, if we should fail, notice he uses the pronoun we here, but Beth still very much sees this as a joint act, that they're in this together. But there's a slight little point here, I'm always quite, um, quite clear to bring out to my classes. We fail, but screw your courage to the stick in place, and we'll not fail. She reject, she redirects the focus back to her husband. Your courage and will not fail. If you do it, we will succeed. It's very much this onus of him being the very active agent in this deed. She says, when Duncan is asleep, will I with wine and wassail so convince she is going to get the barge drunk um, so that they will be out of their minds, they'll be asleep, um, leaving Duncan unattended. She then says, what cannot you and I do? a really interesting sense of the words used here from Lady Macbeth. Notice how when she says this, she still speaks of it as a joint act, but it's not we, it's you and I. Like they have their different roles. She is the one that will get the guards drunk. He is the one that will commit the murder. But it's not a we at this point, whereas it has been previously. It's still very much a sense of you do your part, I'll do mine, and there will be success. It's just very, very interesting how she uses you and I here rather than we, because there's almost like an implied sense that she knows it's him that will commit the act. And then as we finish the scene, we see how Macbeth is completely changed his mind now owing to Lady Macbeth's reaction. Bring forth men, children only. Macbeth is motivating himself through this idea of a masculine identity. And then he goes on to praise Lady Macbeth, thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. That Lady Macbeth's persuasion, Lady Macbeth's prowess is something that has made him reinforce what it is to be a man in such an act. Continuing the scene, we see how he says, I am settled. He's resolute now, but he also then continues to say, and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. While he is decided, he's still aware that he has to bend up, he has to switch, alter everything towards what he still refers to as a terrible feat. He knows still at this point that it's going to be a very evil act. And then we have the final lines here of the scene where he says, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. A very famous quote, realising the importance of having to hide his emotions to all, including himself, to put on a brave face and to endure to commit such a brutal act, such a defenceless man. 
And so concludes our look at Act 1, Scene 7 today. Thank you once again for tuning in. Thanks again once uh, for clicking on the video. Uh, please feel free to like, share, subscribe the video. We are on Twitter at LitGwig, and we are now on Instagram at QuigLit. Please give them a follow, give us a like here, share and subscribe as I mentioned before. All of your support is greatly appreciated by myself. I hope that has been a very good look into Act 1, Scene 7 for you. Please let me know how I can continue with the videos as we go forward. But for now, take care, have a nice day, and until next time, bye-bye.